Welcome to episode 17 of the Crownsman Podcast. I'm your host, Jared Downey. And my co-host today, well, every show, <laughs> is Gaudi Molina. Yes, good morning. Happy International Women's Day. Thank you. And a happy International Women's Day to all women out there. Yes. And our show today is, it is layered to say the least. We talk about mining, we talk about energy, we talk about agriculture on the show. Although a few people, when we started talking about ag- agriculture, were said, what does it have to do with mining? <laughs> because we'd, they'd seen so many of the mining shows. Yeah. Um, we are talking about heavy industry. That's what this show, show is about. We want to give a voice to industry by having the experts come on. And today we have Eric Be- Beckwith, um, who is the founder and CEO of Freitera. Right. So this it's going to be a very good show today. I know that. Um, and first, let's give a shout out to our sponsor, Gowdy. Yes. Um, the show is brought to you by Savannah Equipment. They supply new and used mining equipment around the world from plaster to underground to ore processing plants. Um, and they have a 6500 TPD gold and silver recovery plant for sale right now. So head to SavannahEquipment.com for more information and for more equipment every day. Thank you very much. And they've got a ton of equipment on there. Lots. Like thousands, literally thousands of pieces of equipment. Um, probably some of it gets shipped through Freitera. Um, <laughs> Eric, thank you for coming on the show. Welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, like most people on this show, some, some we've worked with for quite a while. I, you and I talked for the first time yesterday. And <laughs> hours later in the morning, you're here. So um, we'll, we'll wind our way through the conversation. There's a lot to talk about. First off, um, Freitera is a bit different than a lot of companies, so it's still fairly new to some people. What does the company do, uh, sort of the the general overview of the company? Freitera is like Expedia for freight. Mm. So it's it's a single, we're building a single unified market that integrates the transport companies of all sizes and also transport modes. That means the trucking companies, the railroads, the air freight, the ocean freight, the inland waterways into a single platform where Business to business shippers, and our clients are usually warehousers, manufacturers, importers, and distributors, Mm -hmm. can get the best rates, transit times, and service quality online with a click of a button. So we have, instead of calling multiple brokers or calling multiple carriers, companies sign up for a free account with us, they check our rates at 3 a.m., and they book the best rate. And we have over 9,000 manufacturers, wholesalers, et cetera, that have signed up. We have over uh, 15,000 loads that we've booked, and we cover 23,000 communities in North America. Wow. Really? And so this is all, so you're saying it's, it's like Expedia. Um, so it's all, there is no conversation happening. It's all online, through, right? Absolutely. No, just like you, just like when you log into Expedia and, and you check the, the rates from multiple airlines or multiple hotels at once, and you know that when you click that, you're not, there's no nonsense. You're going to pay exactly what you've just booked. It's under contract. It's deal done deal. The same thing with freight right now. When you're shipping freight via the trucking companies or the railroads, whatever it is, you use our system. You enter the origin and destination, the size and weight. If it's cross-border, you'll ne- you also need the freight class. Mm-hmm. You click Get Quote. It takes 10 to 20 seconds. It searches 20 billion lanes across the entire continent, and it gives you the best price or best delivery time or the lowest emission option. You click Book It. All you have to enter is wi- the physical address it's picking up at and the physical address it's going to. And Crazy. it's done. And then there's a, then the carrier has 15 minutes to confirm availability. The larger carries, it's instant. The smaller ones have 15 minutes to verify the purchase order and confirm availability, and it's booked. Right. Okay, and you're done. So are the carriers are the carriers also signing up for this yes. as well? Yes, it's yeah. a two-sided marketplace. So we have 800 carriers that we're currently working with. The carriers sign up for it for free. The carriers enter their rates, and depending upon, that's the secret sauce, depending upon the size of the company, whether they're a single owner operator up to Federal Express, they have different systems that allow them to, to get their rates into the system quickly and efficiently and maintain them. Yeah. Are you doing, uh, you're doing f- every kind of freight, though. You're doing full loads, halves, Absolutely. Pallets. What we're not doing is personal, we, what we're not drawing, doing is personal one-time shipments. So we're not moving furniture for people, moving homes. <laughs> right. All these people have repeat business, but we're shipping everything from honey to building materials, medical supplies, everything. And we have amazing data on the movement of goods all across the continent all the time. And I guess that data is just always growing, hey? That yes. Amount. Yes, absolutely. The um, when I was I was going through the the company, um, I noticed there's there's this uh, there's a very clear green element 
for lack of a better word. You're, I know you are much more uh, educated on it, so I'll let you explain it. But what's that element of the of Freytera? Well, it's very simple. We in, in we are, we're cooperating right now with um, with the SmartWay certification program, which is one of the world's largest um, emissions reduction certification programs. That's run. It's run jointly by Natural Resources Canada and the US EPA. It's a voluntary program. Um, that uh, transport companies get involved in, where they start tracking their idle time, their carbon dioxide emissions, mm -hmm. um, their fuel use, and all of these things. And like like with many things in business, when you track something, or in your budget, when you track something over time, you notice, oop, I'm drink eating a few too many cookies a day, and I'm really drinking way too much wine at <laughs> night. I should cut back. And so over time, they can really improve their performance. And the individual carriers have some of the carriers in this in the system have improved their performance by 50% or more, that is 50% emissions reductions across a wide variety of pollutants, of air pollutants. And so, but the reason that we're interested in that is that I grew up in rural Northern California. I grew up on a farm. Um, so I'm very familiar with how hard people work in the rural areas. I'm familiar with industry. That's where most people worked in mm -hmm. that place. And we had, we built, I got married, I had started having my children. I built a beautiful house for myself, eventually bought the land I wanted to bu buy as a teenager, built the house, and then my kid got totally sick. Kid got asthma, and so I was in and out of the hospital, in and out of the emergency rooms with this very small baby, keeping this baby alive. Mm. Like, what is wrong with this place? Then I came up here as a young family. We had a very small amount of money we'd saved, but we were able to buy an apartment in Vancouver because in those days you could buy an apartment with like ten thousand dollars <laughs> down payment. Those were the good old days, guys. <laughs> and so we came up here in the summer to our little apartment in Vancouver, and the kid got better. Went back home, the kid got sick, and there's like, there's something in the house or in the environment here. And I started researching, and I found that we had that the air where we were. I'm not going to go into the individual pollutants, but the air in the s northern Sierra Nevada, beautiful place near Lake Tahoe, crystal clear skies, was deadly contaminated with downwind of the major cities with a variety of pollutants, mm. and it was causing every family to have asthma. And once we, to proof in the pudding was, we moved here, took him off all of his inhalers, and he's totally better. It's environment. Now, wow. it's controversial when it causes asthma, but one of the key things is environment. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's an allergy. And so, and worldwide, about 60,000 people are dying each year from cancer, cardiopulmonary arrest, et cetera, just from the emissions from shipping in majors concentrated in the ports. It's a huge problem with diesel exhaust in the cities. Lots of children and adults have this problem. So it's personal to me, to the extent we can do something about it. And I'm not in a regulatory approach. I'm talking about a market-based approach, which is what we're using right now, where people are booking the carriers they want w and bet the best price and the best service, but we're promoting the carriers that are low emission. And mm -hmm. we, we can show that later in the, in the show. So that by we're giving you the option to have both the best price and the lowest emission. I actually noticed when I was on your website, and I, I actually had to look because the, the logos and that are quite small. You're not really, you're not, when, when I first went on the site, it's all about getting things shipped. You're, you're not, that's not your main, your main push. It is. It's right. It's all about efficiency. It's, right. a, it's all about efficiency and ease of use and price and service quality. Absolutely. The, so right now, the emissions reductions in our system are like a cherry on top. They're very important internationally in terms of climate change, et cetera, but you don't have to focus on it in terms of efficiency. Yeah. And the, the largest corporations are recognizing that, that if they go through and they look at it from an efficiency perspective and an energy use perspective, they can reduce their emissions 45% and they just make so much more money. Yeah. And now, you, you brought up uh, uh, regulatory. Um, and, and do you think that that's the that's the key long term is is actually economically th within the companies themselves not through regulatory or do you think you need a combination of both okay i i think i have worked in and out of government mm -hmm. i've worked on legislation i've been all over this space um i've worked at ki the county level um you need regulation to keep people that are dangerous from hurting you absolutely if you have some terrible toxic chemical to, that you need to keep out of the, out of the school you mm -hmm. need a regulation to keep it out of the school, okay? But in terms of social change, you need to actually make it work. You need to make the products that are available to people non-toxic. So when they have to buy them, they don't have to buy this toxic stuff. You need to make transportation low emission. So the best way to actually effectively get change done quickly is to go right to the business community, have complete buy-in, and they say, I'm just going to fix that. You don't have to go through the government, through the United Nations, through this other thing to impose a fine on this factory. You go to the owner and you say, hey, We'd like to fix this. He's like, I didn't really realize we had that problem. Mm -hmm. That's the That's ideal right. situation. We're all over it. And then he's like, can we please fix this? And the staff is all resisting because everyone resists any change anyway. But at least it's coming from the top. It says, let's do this. It's going to take three to five years to implement. You know, we buy this new technology and we do this. Mm -hmm. So that's where the cutting edge is. And also, once the economics tips, like it's tipping right now with wind and solar, like it's tipping right now in shipping, 
when it's less expensive to ship the new way, mm-hmm. everyone goes there. So our goal at Freightera is to constantly bring to the top of the marketplace the best technologies and let people see that they're there so they can start using them so people then buy them and make the transition. Yeah. Okay? It's all economic and it's all based on what's best for the companies. Now, when you say bring them to the surface, so when you're pushing them up, is that through is that through an algorithm or are you choosing those or is it because of the just the price? They can't compete. It's actually the beautiful thing is, yeah, it's all it's actually all based on efficiency. So the you've seen those those things with Canada's best top 50 best run companies. Mm -hmm. One of the things about running a company really well is you treat your people really well. You have really excellent culture. You keep your executive pay down to a human scale. The executive doesn't need significantly more than you need. Mm -hmm. We all need a certain amount. And beyond that, it just causes you a nightmare. Okay? And so, and that, and the, and when you do that, you have a very well run company. And then if you, if you recognize, like Walmart in the early stages recognized this, Amazon's acutely aware of this, you need to have fair pricing. The pricing doesn't have to be the cheapest necessarily. Um, in many cases, we are the cheapest, but it needs to be fair. I need to be very focused on the fact that people need the pricing. To IKEA understands this really well. Mm. They have price points for each person, so a student can go in there and buy the table they need. Mm-hmm. And later on, they'll buy a more expensive table, right? But meanwhile, they need that $100 table, and it's perfect, and it's made of pine, and it's good. It works well. So the key yeah. thing is understanding for these small manufacturers that price is critical to them, so making this available to them. So when we say... Um, promoting, bringing up to the top, we're talking about going out and finding those companies that are really well, r- really well run mm. and making certain they're in the system and saying, please join this network because people need you, okay? Because we do have, we accept carriers as they come in, but we also go out specifically looking for the service types that we need and the geographies that we're not covering. Right. Please cover this lane from this part of Ontario into this part of, of uh, Illinois, for example, because yeah. we have a lot of demands and no, sh- no carriers there. Yeah. This is certainly a layman question, but... What is a truck? What what is uh, something that ship electrical though? Yes. I- as opposed to powered by diesel, whether it be train, truck, whatever it is, how much less are we we talking cost wise, um, both to the person getting it shipped, but to also running that? Um, okay, so there's there's actually we're in there are very few there are very few fully electric um, options right now mm-hmm. for shipping freight. The, the primary things that we're seeing, and I'm going to give you real-world examples of this right now. And actually, there's a slide. If you want to put up the slide sure, on yeah. that we have, I think it's slide 13. Mm-hmm. Um, this is from a presentation that I gave uh, a couple of weeks ago to the Clean Tech Alliance in Seattle, which is a group of businesses, including Boeing, that are working on emissions reductions. Here's an example. Right. So this is, this is a real-world example right now. These are both the, the train and the trucks are all diesel-powered. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not, this is not about technology. This is just about efficiency of different mode, transportation modes, right. difference between road transportation and rail transportation. Transportation. So this is a shipper. The port of Long Beach is one of the busiest ports in the world. This is a sh- one of the 15,000 loads that was booked through our automated system. This shipper was shipping this thing. There were a few pallets. They were shipping from Long Beach, California to Denver, New Georgia. So they, they selected, in this particular sort, the carrier that was an intermodal carrier that picked it up with a truck and then put it on the train and then took it off the, the rail and delivered it to the, to the ultimate sh- um, sor- um, end user was using rail. So they, it was 60% less carbon dioxide emissions because of the efficiencies of putting the freight onto a train and track ins- instead of, of the road. And this in this particular case, it was 44% savings. So they spent a little more than $300 instead of, of $580 for that particular load. And we see, we see savings up to 80% in this process, but that's very typical. And companies will shift completely for a few percent you can give them two to five percent reduction; they'll mm-hmm. shift. Forty percent is an absolute no-brainer. They can't afford to ship it they any can't other way. To do it any Absolutely, other way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, in your system, actually, there was another slide I wanted to see that was interesting with your booking. I think you said you're just developing it right now. It's sort of uh, the link to rail system. Yeah, that one. Yes, I, d- I think that if you go forward, forward. Uh, yeah, I think it's forward. Oh, okay. There we go. There that we one. Go. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So this is patent yeah, pending right now. One. So this is what we're working on right now is we're working on greatly expanding. Um, the capacity of rail. So we, s- we see in the future, ra- rail is going to make a major comeback because it's incredibly efficient. And if we can convert, if there's just a few engines you need to convert. If you can convert them either to biodiesel, which some of the trains are beginning to run on, compressed natural gas, which is immediate 35% reduction, these hybrid electric vehicles, or the gold standard is uh, sustainable electric. So the, the electricity comes from wind and sun. And the trains run electricity and you electrify the track. Electrify the track or you pass it overhead. Then you have a zero emission. There's a like 5% emissions in terms of the building of the facilities originally, and then it's zero emission moving forward. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it becomes the least, when you pass on those costs, that is those reduced costs because there's no fuel involved, 
it becomes incredibly inexpensive and efficient to use. And so what you, what you want is we want to help the major railroads, all of which we've signed up in the Project Air platform, all, mm. all the Class 1 railroads are involved now in various stages. Almost all of them have rates live in the system. We want to greatly expand the automated way in which the, uh, the road carriers connect to rail right. so that you don't send a half-full truck dispatched across the country when instead you could take it to the, clo- to the automatically to the closest rail yard, yeah. move it long haul by rail, and pick it up. And the electric technology and the, the, um, and the technology for freight is going, it's being developed in for, for personal transport. Personal transport gets the first electric vehicles, and then it gradually expands capacity. So the l- that what's called last mile delivery will be electric long before the long haul fleets are. Yes, yeah. And, and Amazon's, I've seen them that sort of working on this type of stuff. That last mile is the most, it's actually where a lot of the deliveries happen though, because it's, it's, and I'm, I'm way from yes, but the idea is is yes, is that the the last mile stuff it's really easy to right now with the current technology to make zero emission vehicles or very low emission compressed natural yeah. gas vehicles, but not for the long haul. And the long haul freight right now it's very easy to convert to either use existing rail or convert to rail. So this is to greatly expand the reach of rail yeah. in North America. So we have basically we have a lot of the system set up, but we just don't have the conduit, which is what you're trying to develop. The conduit, the to software, the piece, yeah, the software exactly, the software and the con- things to make it so that it's completely transparent to you. You just click a button on the iPhone, and it's connected all through. You don't need to know any of the details. It's yeah. all in place. Yeah. And okay? you don't need to phone ten different carriers. No, to try no, to no, not together. at all. <laughs> it's just terrible, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you've done, um, you've done. I, I was reading an article. Um, you've done. I'm going to let you explain it because again, it's I I do these. I was explaining to you off a bit off the air. Um, when we do these shows, it's like getting a whole education every time because Freightera. I originally thought, oh, they're a logistics company. So I went on and I went, oh, okay, <laughs> they got a lot more going on. And then there's you've written articles for the G7. Um, you brought this uh, G7 climate change uh, book with you. Can you talk a little bit about what that? What that is all about, um, I try to l- I try to set it up for you, but I'll just have to let you go with it. No, it's a little absolutely. beyond me. Absolutely, okay. Um, for many many years, um, environment ministers and others have been meeting together once a year as what's called the Conference of the Parties. This is sponsored by the United Nations, and it's an attempt to negotiate a way so that we can actually reduce emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, worldwide with all of the volunt- in a voluntary basis with all the governments participating. Okay. And in, 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 in uh, COP21 in Paris, they actually all agreed that on emissions reduction standards and that they wanted to limit it to 1.5 degrees Celsius increase. And I won't get into the science behind it. We could talk about that for hours. Mm-hmm. But it was a consensus among governments that they wanted to do this. And it was good for their economies anyway because the conversion to these new energy sources, et cetera, just makes lots of sense for efficiency and other reasons. It's not the only reason you do it. Yeah. In, at that time, we put out a press release um, saying that the, you really need to have not just governments regulating this, because they, they agree and then they come back and they pass new regulations, but industry needs to lead. Mm-hmm. So following that, we, re- we received a, a, um, um, a proposal c- to a, a request. Could we please write the thought leadership um, article on the green future of freight for the G7 summit in Japan? Yeah. So the G7 meets, and they needed to understand how industry could actually lead. And so we did this. Mm-hmm. We wrote an article, the, the green future of freight in this publication, G7 Climate Change. So this is a publication that comes out of yeah. London. And, uh, and then following that, we were invited to make an enlarged presentation at the United Nations in Marrakesh. So there's about 15,000 people there. The World Bank is there. All the International Monetary Fund is all there. Ministers f- of, of uh, transportation, climate, et cetera, are all there, and non-government organizations. Uh, and so we did that. And following that, we were invited to write for the G7 to the G7 um, Seven Summit in um, 2018 in Canada, where we were the Canadian featured uh, technology company, right yeah. after Minister McKenna, et cetera. I just wanted to clarify one thing, and one Please. of the reasons that transportation is is was such a key element is because it is, now this is certainly not everybody, this is not an attack on transportation, but it is one of the major polluters. Is that right? It's actually, it's becoming, and actually there's a slide that we actually can put up from sure. the European Parliament. If there's a slide that's, uh, I think it's like the third or fourth slide, if you go back, this will be very helpful to understand this. Three, yeah. Here we go. Go back this oh. uh, down to this one. This Perfect. One. Okay, so this is that's from the European Parliament, and I actually have permission to use it. The main thing is is that right now, the primary sources of, of emissions are energy production, 
transportation, and specifically certain parts of agriculture, including animal husbandry and cattle, okay? Right. And th there's solutions in every one of those cases. Don't worry. There's solutions that don't allow, that allow us to continue the life as we know it. They just mm -hmm. have to change certain specific things. But what's happening with freight transportation is that there's very rapid economic development right now outside of what we call the industrial world, what we used to call the, in the developing countries. Right. And that development is involving the movement of goods and s goods, particularly all around the world, in greater, greater velocities, so that the, the total contribution of air and ocean shipping to that mix is increasing dramatically. Right now, it's only about 7%. Freight transportation is about 7, to 7 by some studies, 10% of the total emissions. But it's projected to grow between 20 and 50% of the total emissions by 2050 because the uh, combination of rapid economic growth, which is all good, it's all fine, and reductions in emissions on land. As the various countries figure this out and then mm. solve this, this is growing completely out of control. And that's outside of the whole UN negotiation framework because it occurs directly into the atmosphere in the oceans in international waters. Oh, so I it's see. not regulated. So right. what we're working on is a, and this was a slide I actually presented to the United Nations, going back, presenting the stuff from the European Parliament to the UN. But what we're working on is saying, listen, this is not a regulated thing, but we can still solve this problem by by implementing the correct technology and stimulating investment in the new low emission technologies. So we're we are demonstrating that here in North America with the low emission marketplace. What we're creating now is something worldwide that allows us to s direct the freight to the lowest emission and in most cases the least expensive option and then stimulate the transition of this the shipping industry and airlines there's all these alternative fuels they're coming out with that are net zero emission there's also all the electric the electric aircraft they're coming out and other systems you'll see in later if, if we can see in this presentation very cool yeah. technology yeah. for moving freight by air <coughs> right um sorry i actually cut you off when you're talking no about it's okay apologies. that's fine it's fine um so so this article that you wrote is that that sort of what it was wh what was that based around this this recent article that you wrote in here uh the most recent article was really a call for the for uh Canada to actually enter the world stage and really lead with this approach that says we don't have to have strict emissions standards on carbon dioxide. We need to be promoting these new technologies. And if you, if the technologies, if you are lucky, as we are now in the cycle, mm. where solar and wind are less expensive, for example, than putting in nuclear or, God, nuclear is the most horribly expensive thing, especially with mm -hmm. the insurance process. It's basically dead economically, uh, let alone on the environmental impacts. But, uh, you allow when you have when you're in the look lucky place like this where the new technologies are more efficient and less cost less to operate, mm -hmm. build them as fast as you can, and then let the market forces just redirect all mm -hmm. of that freight or all of that investment mm -hmm. there. It, that's, that's what we're focusing. That's on. the the sort of the one of the challenges though, right? Is that initial investment because you have to develop that infrastructure and to scale and everything like that, right? Is that is that where do you think uh, more of the uh, in a way, s I guess still the resistance to it is, is that initial, okay. or is it that, that um, companies that are already established already dug in, and so they kind of just want to hold on to these? It's the, the issue with what we're dealing with right now is there is no investment. So the, p the, people, that, the people that are working with, with Freterra, it's not that it's limited by investment at all. It's that we, they're succeeding because they are more efficient and they're low emission. And as this system grows and as more and more people shift to them, become mm -hmm. aware of the technology, it makes it safe for them to say, I will invest in this new technology because I'm going to win with it. That's mm -hmm. the key. You need to see. People are very conservative in investment. They should be. Especially and they want to see they want to see it works and they yeah. want to see it's gonna make money for sure. So mm -hmm. that's the key. So it's not that you acquire investment to work with Freitera, quite the opposite. It's that we're highlighting those companies that are already really efficient and right. they're becoming more so and saying, You guys win in this market. Yeah. You win, congratulations. Yeah. You guys are awesome. I want to get into some of those companies in a bit. Um Gaudi, I'm gonna switch over and uh, let's let's give a shout out to our other sponsor here yes. and then go into the second half. Yes. So um, the show is also brought to you by Resource World Magazine Reports um, on, uh, sorry, I'm going to do that one again. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. The Crownsman Podcast is also brought to you by Resource World Magazine. They report on the business of mining, oil and gas, green technologies, and the events that affect these sectors. You can catch their February-March issue and see all the latest news at resourceworld.com. Awesome, and we're doing Great. a nice little cost promotion. Actually, they're putting our they're promoting our show on their website. Oh, that's and fantastic! Yeah, so. <laughs> um, okay, well, I actually um, was looking at your LinkedIn profile, um, kind of wanting to know a little bit more about you, and I saw um, this about Sierra Biodiversity Institute. 
It seems very interesting, um, but there wasn't a lot of information on there. So I kind of want to know what what that was, what or what it is. I'm, I'm not going to if it's still around. Uh, it's not. It's something that I created with my father. And okay. If you, if you go dig way, way back into childhood, um, I was very interested in birds as a f like an 11 year old. And then I discovered that all of these bird species that used to be here are extinct in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries and accelerating right now. And that really made me sad as a child. And I started breeding rare and endangered birds. Huh? Okay. Like 30 species of them at all over at the 11? world. Yes. And then, wow. so, so there are some people that are just in love with nature. And that's yeah. how I was. I was interested in birds. I would help them out of their little shells and do these things. <laughs> and then I expanded my interest into botany. And I ran a rare plant nursery. And by the time I was 18, I was interested in conservation in sight. Because we had all these programs where we keep things off site, these endangered animals. And you have them in a little nursery or you have them in a, in a botanical garden, but they're extinct in the wild. So I realized the best thing is you keep these things alive in the wild. So I got interested in public land policy. And in the backyard where I grew up, there was a million acres of public land. And it was connected altogether to 20 million acres of public land. That's the Sierra Nevada, this wow. huge, gorgeous thing yeah. in California. So I, over time, I had a lot of funding from out of San Francisco and from, from, from big corporations big like Hewlett Packard and the Gap Foundation and um, um, uh, Trustful Mutual Understanding, uh, you know, seven, I'm 17 major grants and awards okay. working in this field on conservation. And I was on the lecture circuit. You asked me why I was at Stanford University. I was lecturing on federal law and policy and I was lecturing on wow. conservation and I was lecturing on conservation biology, gra undergraduate and graduate level. So, and I was traveling and meeting people and I had hundreds of connections in and out of government, academia, all of these people, right? O other organizations. So it's, it's the same thing that we're doing right now. The focus was on conservation, which means wise use. And we were an advocate for actually how to live in the place without causing the extinction of the local plants and animals. That was the purpose of Sierra Biodiversity Institute. Wow. Okay, and I left it when I moved up here because my child got sick and I had to abandon all of that. Oh my goodness. So I was an environmental refugee. That is, I left because the air became too contaminated. It's for adults, people, and most animals, they're tough. Their mm -hmm. infants are weak. Yeah. Right. And if you get into a bad environment, your infants don't survive. That's what happens. It's terrible. And that that's happens to us, and it's true to plants. And all that. So I had that, that direct experience of being part of nature. Here we are. We're mm -hmm. in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Did did being, was that a big kind of part of you now with uh, Fright Terra? Uh, a, a huge influence? I mean, the being part of. The training, being trained in, being trained in, um, in biology and also in ecology and in biospherics. This idea that everything is interconnected. This idea that, I, I grew up on a farm, okay? And I had 50 acres. And I was a very hardworking person, and I would have to take care of 50 acres of land. As I got to be a little bit older, I started taking care of the entire county. Then I was taking care of 20 million acres of land, okay? Because I was thinking about it and worried about it. And then I realized that the future of the world depended on the, the dust that came into the air what over Central Asia. It was all interconnected, and I was terrified. It was all one thing, that the rain patterns that we had in the northern Sierra Nevada were a direct result of emissions into the air from northern China. And vice versa. It's not just that the Chinese are doing something to us. We're doing something to them. So we're all interconnected. So that was that's a visceral thing that you feel in your gut. It's not just a scientific thing. And that's the upshot of this all of this work right now with global change and global climate change is that we're all interconnected. And when we're at the end of this, we'll realize we're all part of a much larger living organism, which is cooperating, just as nation states cooperate. So it doesn't mean it's all not this also not nature fierce and tooth and claw and that aren't spiders eating flies. Absolutely. But there's also a level of cooperation at the biospheric level, which is extraordinary and which will be increasingly understood both scientifically and in public policy. Yeah. It's all interrelated. Yeah. Wow. It's interesting. I, I, I noticed that because you have been involved in, in government, you've um, you know, you're involved with the G7 and and why? I know you you've kind of touched on it that they they both have to work uh they both have to work together regulatory and economically um but which is going to i guess for lack of a better question what why do you go to the business road you you got involved in the conservation even when you were young and now you're going the business road again so it's it's not like you switched from from government to this you've always stayed in that private sector it seems okay it's actually if you work in and out of government, it's incredibly frustrating to spend years, hire a bunch of scientists, develop this plan, have the plan set on the shelf, there's an election, mm -hmm. it gets thrown away, it just gathers dust. And the, the, the planning is very, very important. 
Um, but implementing the plan when the people want to do something else or industry wants to do something else is really difficult. Mm -hmm. You really want to have consensus. And you want to understand, you want to talk with people and understand, well, this is why we think this is important. How can we make this work? Here's our goal. And not just impose on them, say, mm -hmm. this is what we're going to do. Just sit down now. We're going to, whether you're, whether you're big brother or whether you're a government, right? Also, as a practical matter, governments have been much less powerful recently. Industry really runs the world. Mm -hmm. And you can, you, can, you, can, you can think that as, oh, it's a disaster, et cetera. But the fact of the matter is that's how it is. That's why we're so concerned about big contributions to political parties from major developers and stuff, because they have huge power. So if you're going to actually make any effective change, you need to understand who's really in control, who seems to be in control, and who's really in control. And business, international business, is hugely powerful. So they really need to lead if anything meaningful is going to happen. And we, we had that experience in the county where I was part of county planning government, and we had a major landowner who didn't like it. They destroyed everything. They destroyed it got, and got rid of the other people. And they just funded the other people, and it was useless because we didn't have buy-in from them because they were afraid. Mm -hmm. And it was totally, retrospectively, it was totally wrong-headed to think that we could, just because the government was thought it was a good idea, that these people could, we didn't have to listen to them. You have to have everyone involved, and then they would have been the biggest advocate if we had got them. Take yeah. the time to make them an advocate. So the key is it's not a matter of coercion at all. It's a matter of saying, here's the problem. What do you think we should do? And really listening to everyone. Yeah. So this is a much better place to work from in industry than anywhere else because we have the ability just to change. Right. Okay? We can just decide to change, and we don't have to. You don't have to sue us or do anything else or impose legislation or tariffs or that stuff on it. We just change because we want to. Yeah. Yeah. Because we think it's the right thing to do, and it makes us feel good, right? Did that uh, Did that change your uh, though running into that? Uh, did that change the way you approached developing a company like Freight Terror, running into someone that threw some money behind someone else and and shut it down and gave you all those challenges? Has that Did that sort of shape the way that you approach things going forward? It must have. Well, like most people. We set out, both my wife and I set out, we were trained in a particular thing. We set out, we ended up working in something else, right? We came up here, we created a software company. The, the consulting work I was doing previously and the grants all dried up. So we created a software company developing international business systems, both for non-government organizations, service organizations, but which are very important. And a, and a lot of very important work uh, is done by big non-government organizations, right? Mm -hmm. Things like the Red Cross, you can think of immediately, right? Why they're there. Um, but also big businesses. Um, they weren't they weren't like multinational corporations. These were businesses that could become very large. Mm -hmm. So the, the, our software company built, the, our underlying team of people then built Freytera, right? Um, so we came into this from business, which was great training because we needed to survive as business people. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about all living on grants or something else. And yes, we ran a business for many years without any investment from the outside. It was only our own money. So we also know how to run it without burning investor money, which is mm -hmm. the other problem in business. They yeah. just survive on massive influxes of capital that they burn. Especially right? in, because you're sort of, you're kind of, are in that tech sector. We are. Yeah. And we have we are we are uh, funded by angel investors. Mm. That is, these are business individual families and business people that have made money and then have sold their business and that are retired and are investing in other businesses, family mm. offices. And we're just getting the first institutional funding now. But we're really backed by 130 families, which is really different than being backed by some massive corporation or something else. Right. It's yeah. really nice. cool. And they're going to make a fortune when we make a fortune. Yeah. They normally like the venture capitalists would. It's mm -hmm. going to be these teachers, literally. That are backing us. Yeah. yeah. And does that give you more flexibility? Because when you run off things like grants and that, you are definitely, y there. you have to lay out what you're going to do and then there's certain thresholds. But, I mean, you run a business. So you know that you're going one way and then realize, oh, I got I to gotta shift. Does that mm -hmm. give you more flexibility with that setup? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And that, that's the fundamental problem with grants. Grants are, the, the chain is very long, but it's still a chain. Mm -hmm. You promise to do a particular thing, and I've run into that exact problem. Where even with a small grant, if you if you don't do exactly what you said you were going to do, you do something that's much more leveraged and much more efficient. They're upset with you, right? Because you said you do this thing. I said that thing was not going to work anymore. It's yeah. changed now. Yeah. I did this, and it was. And I, in one case, I'm talking about turned a five thousand dollar grant into a five hundred thousand dollar program, fully funded by other entities, and they fired me. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't fund me anymore because they said you didn't do this. I said I just turned this into this. They said you didn't do exactly what you said you were going to do. So yeah. yeah, so the actual that thing happens in business too. You need to actually mm -hmm. have, you need to actually have a plan, a business plan, and, that, and, that, and that, but you're not necessarily going to follow it because the market's not going to be that way. Things aren't going to work out like you expect. 
other opportunities are going to come up they're going to be much more effective mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that's real and everyone in business understands that right yeah, yeah. What's, what's the note actually and i was going to try to bring it up um i can't find it um we on the phone yesterday you talked about your business model versus a real versus a real world and i can't actually remember if we can't we'll, we'll move on from it um sort of what you expected freytera sort of their their to to facilitate what what it actually ended up facilitating. Do you remember that? What Absolutely, yeah. no, they, we do, and it's actually it's very interesting. So one of the, one of the problems in transportation right now, and it's a huge problem both for uh, for the for the transport companies, is that there are too many small companies that are not coordinated, and too many vehicles are empty. So typically, a truck is booked eighty percent of the time. It has to drive all the way back empty. Mm -hmm. and typically, with less than truckload, when the trucks are driving down the road, thirty percent of the trucks on the road are empty. If you could just X-ray them, you'd see they're empty. They're just mm -hmm. repositioning them. They're burning all this fuel, moving all these trailers around. So we thought when we created Freightera that by having a market mechanism, literally by having an ability to discount the price, like you do at the last minute for airfare, right, where you can discount it and get on the plane. Yeah that there'd be a discounted rate and that carriers would love this so they could fill those empty vehicles and that we would redirect the traffic to the empty vehicles. That was that the initial. Found. Yeah, that's what we thought, for sure. Makes sense. Great. No one bought into it, okay? So they didn't do it at all. They were unwilling to discount the rates. And I think that part of it is that I think it's kind of like the supermarkets that are afraid of what happens when they take the cheese that's being the next day that's going to be pulled and thrown in the garbage can and put 30% on sale, that people will only buy the discounted cheese. Mm -hmm. okay? And they have to, you have to get over that fear to figure out an economic model that works because then it's going to go from instead of getting 70% of it, you're going to get nothing for it the next day. It's going That's into the right. garbage can. Right. Yeah. Okay? But you're still afraid. So the same rules apply. So we found that the carriers were unwilling to discount those, but the difference in price between the well-run carriers and the other carriers was so great that we could direct the freight all the time. Like the, We thought, oh, they like discount it some X percent. I won't say the exact amount because it's business secret. And then we found they would discount it two to three times more permanently, no sale price, just by using the correct carrier on the correct lane. Oh. So that was a big surprise. And that's the kind of thing you just wouldn't know until you got in there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so you couldn't you couldn't you do could some market research and get that answer. No, you wouldn't find it until you've talked to other business people and you realize the people running the companies and you realize this is how they work. It's just not scary for them. Those are their rates. There's no change for them. There's no danger in it. They're yeah. just saying, this is what it costs us right. to do this. And like, yeah. that's amazing. You guys are efficient. You have no idea. You're charging 25% as much as that other company. <laughs> right. Okay. And you're making money. They're making money. I said, like, great. Post those rates. So one of the challenges, in a way, you're also, in a way, it's a marketing thing for them is too, because now they weren't, they weren't really getting a, those other bigger companies or less yes. efficient companies. As long as they get in front of them, you never know. You might have yes. all 10 of the wrong companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's free marketing for carriers. It's really good this way. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. It's amazing, actually. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I wanted to talk about some of the companies that are doing these investments. I know there's in Europe. Um, you showed some slide, and I want to get into a few different things because there's there are companies that are, I mean, they're opening factories for their electric vehicles. Um, I'm seeing things between companies like DHL and Ford. They're collaborating. Can you talk about some of the 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 companies, the the carriers that are making these investments or are or have? Um, yeah, I think that I think that one of the best cases from a from a, an international logistics company perspective is DHL. Uh, we've we've had lots of conversations with DHL. They're one of the largest, if not the largest, logistics company in the world, depending on the statistics that you read. And they they actually are uh, Europe is generally much more progressive in terms of emissions reductions than North America is. There's a lot of people in North America that care, but in general, more of the population does. And so if you, if you DHL, when we toured their facility, in front of the facility, it's all these electric vehicles. It's all about zero emissions by 2050. And I asked about these, and they said, listen, we wanted to build, because they're part of the, of the, the German postal systems, like the German mm -hmm. post office, right. DHL. They wanted to build all these zero emission small vehicles for delivering uh, mail and parcels. And some of them are pedal assist, like we see now in Vancouver. Some of them are purely electric, but they're beautiful little things. And no one would manufacture them for them because they didn't they didn't feel there was sufficient demand. So they became an electric vehicle manufacturer. They're the largest electric vehicle manufacturer in Europe. As a result of this. As a result of this, they just got ahead and started building electric vehicles. And and there is a transition now occurring. I don't know if you're following this, but the I want to buy an electric car. I haven't bought an electric car yet because I'm not going to buy a Tesla. They're too expensive. And I also wanted to go at, at least 250 miles. I'm not going to be afraid. I don't want to be afraid that I'm gonna, my battery's going to be dead at 80 miles, right? But now, and I need a four-wheel drive vehicle because I go back up into the mountains. I take my kids in the snow, et cetera. I'm insecure. Sound familiar, guys? Okay. Yeah, we were just Guess talking what? about that. There's an entire fleet. There's 12 new options that are all electric, zero-emission vehicles that are coming on the market at the end of this year. And Fantastic. they're increasingly com totally price competitive with the, with the to purchase them 
with the conventional gasoline vehicles, and then the cost of operation is a fraction of it, and the cost of maintenance is a fraction of it. So as this continues, the electric, the gasoline-powered vehicle is dead. It's mm -hmm. gone. Goodbye. Nobody, once they've gotten into these things, and they have, there's no more range problems, and the, the cost of uh, ownership is low, is going to buy an electric car. It's going to buy a, a, a gas-powered car again. Yeah. Okay, And so the same process is, is happening with these fleets of vehicles as it becomes available. It's just which are the applications. And with the current cost of the batteries right now, battery technology is going through that same exponential decline right. that solar power did. Because for a long time, it was prohibitively expensive. And for a long time, it kept plateaued. It's barely expensive, barely affordable. And then it just collapsed starting around 1998. It's right down, right? Yeah. Till, until it's like, how low is it going to go? So as that happens and we convert, there will be a moment where you just don't go back. Yeah. And you're gonna, they're going to be recycling and crushing all those, those cars. Couldn't even right? imagine going back. Yeah, you yeah. Would just it's laughable, actually. You're going to like, that's just so, like, no more than you go back to the like, phone from 1970 with the cord. It's like, you've seen the, yeah. Like, no, yeah. we don't do that anymore. That's just dumb. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> other than records, people keep bringing those back. Yeah, the records are cool. No, absolutely. <laughs> but, you know, there's some things you just don't go back to, right? Yeah. The other, I want to talk about some of these projects. I saw one on the slide. It's crazy Europe underground. Oh, yeah. Let's actually go out to that. Let's we, funny, as you're bringing that up, Gary, we actually had Bombardier on wrong. the show um, it was Bombardier was last spring, and yep. they came on the show, and they were talking a little about further, their, yes. their underground systems for... Okay, here we go. Yeah. yeah, all right. So this is this is the Trans-Siberia Project. Uh, not just Trans-Siberia, called uh, Trans-Bearing Project. And this is actually Interbearing. See, it says Source Washington Post, the Schiller Institute, Interbearing 2016. So mm -hmm. there's a... This... Um, the Russians and the Chinese are totally interested in this. They're totally interested in funding this. The actually, we've been on the Trans-Siberia Railroad all the way east to where it ends right here right now. They're actually proposing right now to build this track. They have it in their budget, actually, to build the track out to that point mm. right there. And the, there's only a limited amount of track that needs to be built, primarily actually in Canada, connecting here, connecting up into Alaska. There's oh, definitely so some track. Of it's our, the, the infrastructure, some of it's already there. Oh, yeah, a lot, a lot oh. of it's there. It's just it's actually a very little bit of connecting that has to be done. But the bottom line is, is that this is the proposed, there's the proposed Canadian segment, there's proposed, and there's the rest of it right there. And this is, we'll have to enlarge this to actually to see it. But yeah, here's we'll the, bring the it most up important thing. thing. Yeah. The most important thing is that we have the technology, we have the resources, the Russians and the Chinese are all over funding it on their side, which is much more of the work, to actually build an intercontinental railway system that would be a combination of high-speed trains and freight trains. It could all be zero-emission electric. Uh, that would totally connect the old world and the new world. Okay. And it's per perfectly feasible, as, as I recall, the bearing, the bearing Project, it's 60 miles of underground tunnel or, or a bridge. It's like $60 billion. It's, it's, just, it's an infrastructure project and, and that a country could take on, let alone internationally could take on, right? right? And let alone well, if you got Wall Street and, the, and the, the European markets just fund, the pri fund it privately, right? Yeah. So and that, what, that, what that would enable is, first of all, it would enable the movement of agricultural goods like the Canadian wheat to China. It would enable the tourists, all the tourists, people that don't want to fly and that don't want to go by, by ship. We don't want to go by ship anymore mm -hmm. to sit on a train. I love trains. And go to Paris. Oh I just got yes. back from Japan. It was yeah. just the train system. It's amazing. Yeah, all right. It's, it's basically, it's almost inevitable as long as we can just keep maintaining peace between all these different countries and just work this out in terms of global economic integration. So we've been promoting that. We promoted that in Silicon Valley. The issue is when in the United States, North America, people are like, what? What's that? In Asia, they're like, yeah, we know all about that. We're building that. Yeah. yeah. Here, they're like, oh, yeah, what are you smoking? Yeah. Yeah, it's like I'm not smoking anything. Yeah. I'm like that's inevitable, dudes. So <laughs> anyway, so unrealistic. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but we want to make that in our lifetimes. We want to see that happen. Oh, Absolutely. that would be fantastic. So yeah. are you but you're are you talking um is there potential and talk of this for in between lo large waterways? Like are we, are we talking about training underground or well, is no, that Well, no, the Bering Strait where we walked, you know, when people came to the New World for the first time, that was at it was during this this uh, glacial period and this mm -hmm. was actually the sea levels were much lower and you could walk. The continents were connected. Yeah. There's only 60 miles that separates it. It's very shallow water that separates the new and the old world right there. Right. So that tunnel goes through that close point and there's actually islands, three islands halfway through. So you don't even have to in the middle of it, you actually come above ground again. Mm. So it's actually uh, segments. It's like uh, you know a, a thirty mile segment and a thirty mile segment and some short segments. Mm -hmm. So it is not an engineering problem. It's just a matter of a political problem of actually just getting it done, yeah. right? Okay, right. investment and in political. So uh, we're promoting it because it would be great to be able to move all this stuff via electric rail. Yeah, between continents as in addition in addition to in inside to the continents yeah. and people. And, and people. people, yes, and yeah. people, and also, and we're not even talking about like a putting in a uh, the hyperloop system. And one of our one of our clients in our previous company was an airline pilot who developed the hyperloop 
system map for the whole world, and we published it because he wanted to see this 5,000 mile an hour super train that connected the entire continents. And I think they're building that in. Yeah, they're building segments of it, but that's that's like futuristic, and we're talking we're just talking about regular high trains and maglev train technology that's been around 50 years here. Yeah. We don't have to go to Hyperloop. Hyperloop can follow it eventually. Yeah. Uh, but then it's 5,000 miles an hour. You don't see anything. <laughs> yeah. You're just like zip, and you're like in a spaceship, and, <laughs> and it decelerates, and you're in Moscow. That's and it's right. like get off, and it's I just got on. Yeah. yeah, too fast. Yeah, I think the whole point of <laughs> yeah. traveling on a train yeah. is to see everything, right? Yeah, to exactly. See the beauty of yeah. of the world. That's right. <laughs> but you said I, I think you you mentioned. I mean, they're using this. Th this oh yeah, no, se whole segments of this all over. First of all, the China is investing right now a trillion dollars in connecting into the interior like this through Kazakhstan, etc. They've already shipped the first goods from China to England this way because it's mm -hmm. actually much safer and faster than go sending it around. Like they send it in 14 days on the existing trail network, train network. So that this is already in progress. This is all in. This infrastructure over here is all in place. I've been on it. That's the trans siberia Railroad. It's fantastic. There's actually two tracks, one here and one here. So the, it, we're just talking about this part of it right here and a little bit in Alaska and a part right here in Canada. The rest of it's all built. So it's, yeah, it's connecting it. It's yeah. connecting the rail systems. But Most of that stuff was that done in the 19th century. This <laughs> section up here, though, that politically, that's going to be the tough one. Yeah, and also, yeah, the, the environment community will be worried about the exploitation yeah. of resources up there. There's a bunch of things. Mostly it's a matter of relations between Russia and the United States. That's mm -hmm. the big one. It's just having good relations between Russia and the United States. For a sustained period of time. While yeah, and I, I'm, I'm married. I'm a product of the, of, the peace, of the peace and prosperity after the fall of the Soviet Union, funded by, the, by all these forward-looking people in, in uh, Washington and in New York who sent me to Russia, to the Soviet Union, again and again. So I know all these scientists, and I'm married to a Russian, and so I don't have any troubles with the Russians. I know the Russians well, but it's just a matter of politics. And the Russians are ready when they're at, you want to sign in something? We'll sign. They're just like, okay, you want to growl? We'll growl. Yeah. So, But they're all there, mostly raising their children and drinking vodka and <laughs> producing a lot of organic food and waiting for us to come to our senses and say, let's shake hands again. Yeah. Let's build a train. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, th I think that's, you know, and I, like, I, I don't... Uh, when I come back from a trip and and I'll get asked things about a country and it's uh, I go there sometimes not realizing and it's just uh, so much of it is education that people just don't especially if you haven't traveled you can't really you can't understand uh, how do they say it the people that the the differences that people think that we have are usually not but but the differences that they don't they or the th way that we they think we're the same are actually the opposite like I found in Japan, there are certain elements that I thought would be different, but I found, no, I integrate fine into here. But then there was other things I just didn't see coming that were just different. You know, the way that they follow systems in their train. I, I went to a slide a train open. And in, in Vancouver, if you go to hold the door open, a guard might even help you. <laughs> <They're not laughs> they've got your hand on their shoulder, they're pulling you back, right? And so there's these differences. And I don't know how we. I don't know how we approach it. I guess on a political level, that's about or or in business. Those are kind of the two platforms you can do it, because individuals, uh, unless you're traveling to these countries, I don't really think you can understand that Russia is gro growing a whole bunch of organic food. I mean, where are you going to get that information? Why would you get that? Why information? would you know? No, it's very important to travel as much as you can, so that because you're constantly understanding other cultures, again, how similar they are, understanding what the world looks like from those mm -hmm. from the perspective of those people. But I can tell you that having been traveling to Russia since late Soviet times, when it was in depression, it was terrible, it was ho hopeless, the Russians are doing so much better than ever before. They've just built the interstate highway system, like in the 1950s in the United States. Mm -hmm. They've just built the first high-speed highway system. The, they've rebuilt all their infrastructure. The sports stadiums are all new. If you fly over it, it's just construction as far as the eye can see. And this is under sanctions. They're thriving. They are all they're building kindergartens, schools. There's, there's lots of young children again because there, there was a depression. There was no children for a while. It was really scary. They just couldn't afford to have children. So they're doing really well. The only thing right now is just internationally is just removing the sanctions, et cetera, and just restoring good relations. But internally and agriculturally, oh, they've agriculture output hasn't been seen since the great since the, the revolution. Mm -hmm. They're competing on the world stage and produ outproducing wheat. Everyone is afraid of them how fast they're producing wheat. Yeah. And they're totally non-GMO, and they're totally focused on organic food, leading the world in organic food, which is like, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you're seeing that old in places like Africa where they are, it's initial development on um, things like uh, fiber optic. They, they're, of course, not going to lay the old cables in the ground. They're going to do fiber. So all of a sudden, the, com the countries, that, I mean, Russia is more advanced than in, in Africa, but in Africa, the development they're doing, that initial that's the initial investment, so it ends up being the most up to date. Yep. Whereas Canada, now you have infrastructure issues because you you try to lay fiber into a place like New West, 
you've got to integrate into all these systems. And even if you lay it here, well, that doesn't necessarily mean you've got to get fiber over there and all that sort of stuff. And that's the challenge exactly. of developed countries are going to run into That's now. exactly right. And that's the, it's the joke that in Silicon Valley, they have some of the worst cell reception <laughs> anywhere in the world. <laughs> yeah. And they have tunnels you go through where the calls are always dropped. Yeah. It's in Silicon Valley. Coming here today on the SkyTrain. Yeah. My calls were dropped oh, as I went through the tunnels. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, speaking of technology, okay, now <laughs> yeah. it's all good. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll try, we'll, try to get that, uh, we'll try to get that fixed. Um, oh, oh, good. You're good. There you go. I want to uh, – there was something I wanted to bring up before we, we wrap up the show, and I'm um, – we covered a lot of ground because a lot of the notes, we just kind of pushed them together. So I want to um, – actually, I know what it was. It was for Preterra. Um, how do people – they just go on the website, um, and I if you're a equipment company or a mining company or whatever you're, you're shipping – you could just log, you just sign up for it, right? Yes. And then you have to have someone in your team that understands, obviously, like every company. You have to understand the shipping dimensions and all that sort of stuff. And th is that pretty much it? Yes. Yeah, so you sign up. Both carriers and shippers are the same. It's a free account. So you sign up. We need to vet them. So we, we need to make sure, as you sign up as a shipper, we need to make sure basically you're an industrial shipper. Um, we, we don't, we don't want to make sure you're not a carrier that's trying just to look at the rates of your competitors, which we don't allow. Right. And so we have a human being that vets it. And we have a role is within oh five minutes to turn it on. But we make sure that it's not just a competitor just trying to poke around, that you're actually are shipping, that you're doing repeat <coughs> shipments. And it can be anything. We just don't work with personal shipments. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Same thing with a carrier. You sign up if you want to work with us. We vet that you're a real carrier. We have people signing up from all over the world now. Our system accepts signups from Namibia. So we have a trickle oh. of people, even though we're not advertising, they want to use this already from other right, places. Right, no kidding, yeah. So, um, and we will, we will let the shippers, we'll turn those shippers on now. The carriers, not yet, because we don't have the, we're not supporting them yet there in yeah. those countries. And also, it's a language issue. Mm, yeah. You've got to speak the language to support them, yeah. right? So that's coming. Yeah, but it's very easy. Are you <coughs> seeing Are you seeing now other new companies, uh, like, coming into this space, competing with you, or...? There are um, there's a new Frost and Sullivan study uh, that just came out on the all of the entire competitive landscape globally in what yeah. they call the the, on the digital on demand freight brokerage space. So in that space, they find that Freightera is one of the top five companies in North America. Mm. There's four other companies that are of similar scale that are scattered, which is fine. It's a six hundred over six hundred billion dollar year market in North America. Not to worry, that's the United States alone. Mm. This is. This is um, the brokered market. Let me just be clear. The mar brokered market that we're in is $730 billion a year globally, growing to $940 billion by 2025. Yeah. That's the space that we are that we're building out into. It's right. very large. And we're in the top fif 13 to 15 companies globally in terms of a combination, according to Frost and Sullivan, in terms of a combination of automation and the probability of rapid growth through 2025. Right. So, yes, competitive, but yes, but we're in, in one of the top companies. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Eric. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, a real pleasure. Take care. Thank you. We're just going to do a quick sign off here. and uh, Awesome, please. Thank you for watching the show. A um, lot of information today, and uh, it's a lot of the shows. We end up with knowing, seeing other areas that we need to dig into, and I, I certainly think this is one of the show. Um, you never know. Maybe we can uh, get Eric to come back on and uh, dig into some stuff. Um, Gowdy, where can people follow us? Find yes. us, listen to us, watch everywhere, us. Everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Um, well, you can watch the Crownsman Podcast on YouTube at Crownsman Podcast. Um, you can also follow us on Facebook at Crownsman P. That's also at on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, again, all at Crownsman P. You can listen to the podcast if you don't want to watch it. Um, you can listen to it on Spotify, Anchor, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Breaker, um, just everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I keep seeing on LinkedIn that people are starting to share it, and I keep seeing all these platforms like Spotify and that. So yes. it's just all over the just place. We're, so. we're everywhere. And so we we thank yeah. you for your support in what uh, yes. in watching and and you know, the we're we're just kind of giving a platform, but the voice of industry is really the people that are working in and driving it mm -hmm. forward, and the listeners. So thank you very much, and we will see you next episode.